All right, we're going to move on to reinsurance. So again, some of these will be reviewed by this point as we've kind of pulled in terms as we go along, but we'll go ahead and introduce some new ones as well. So the first we've talked about reinsurance. It's insurance for an insurance company, right? That helps them manage their risk. An unauthorized reinsurer. So when reinsurers, if a company is set up just to be a reinsurance company, uh, they don't have to be authorized by anyone, but it's recommended they're authorized by the NAIC. So if a carrier insurance company is participating in a reinsurance agreement, they need to know whether that party is authorized or not by the NAIC. And you'll see in our next definition that this is largely what it's impacting is that reserve credit is often. So if a company is getting rid of risk, they're seeding that reinsurance, seeding those policies, then they'll take a reserve credit where they can get to reduce their reserves. If the company that they're sending that risk to is not an authorized reinsurer, then they're typically not allowed to reduce their reserves. And even sometimes their department of insurance where they're headquartered may require them to put in some additional funds to help support that. So that's an important thing to know if you're entering into a reinsurance agreement, make sure you know if the reinsurer is authorized or not. And we've talked about assumed and seated premium. Reminder again, just assumed is when you're taking on more risk as a company, seated is when you're getting rid of that, you're sending it to someone else. So there's a few different kinds of reinsurance agreements that are typical that you'll see for property and casualty carriers. So we're gonna go through those and kind of some of what the benefits are. So the first is called a quota share. You might hear it referred to as a first dollar. Uh, so what this is, is where a re the reinsurance agreement says that it's a specific percentage of every policy they're going to split. So for our example, we'll say 50-50. So for every policy that a carrier writes, they're going to send 50% of that to the reinsurer. Um, they'll send both premiums and losses are divided that way. So it's called first dollar because there's not a certain threshold that has to be met before the agreement kicks in. It's on every policy. Uh, one thing you'll note on the second bullet point there is if a dollar amount might be used to split the policy instead of um, a percentage, then you'll hear it referred to sometimes as co-insurance versus quota share. The idea is the same, there's just a slight terminology difference. One important thing to, hear note, to note here is that because you're splitting um, the losses and premiums on each policy, that the associated assets and liabilities also follow. So for example, premiums receivable, there would be a re, an associated reinsurance premiums payable for the amount you're gonna split. Or on the losses side, if you have you know, loss reserves, you're going to have reinsurance recoverable to offset some of those. So some of the benefits as to why a carrier might go with this type of reinsurance policy is they're able to manage risk across an entire block of policies. Um, so if you know there's a specific, you want to manage it for a specific state or a specific type of coverage, you can set up a reinsurance agreement where you're going to help manage the risk for that entire block instead of having to do it more individually. The next one is that you can use a reinsurance pool to help do this where you can Put those policies into a pool and maybe you assume some back. In that case it's more diversifying risk as a tool to manage versus just uh, passing it off to someone else. So here's an example of what some journal entries would look like for that. So like we mentioned when you the company or the carrier is going to book their premiums just like they normally would. You're going to book the full amount as premiums receivable as well as premiums. That says $500,000. And then here you'll note we're assuming a 50% insurance, reinsurance. So you'll see that we've booked a contra revenue account as well as a liability account for half of those premiums. So when we net all of that, the net premium would be the $250,000 and there's a net $250,000 receivable. So the second entries, set of entries is you'll see we're recording the claims and the concept is the exact same. So they'll record the full claims expense account amount. So $50,000 to the claims expense and cash paid out for $50,000. Uh, 
But then because their reinsurance agreement says they're splitting everything 50-50, they're gonna be expecting to get $25,000 back to help cover their claims. So you'll see here that we've booked a reinsurance recoverable, which is an asset that helps offset our liability, as well as a reinsurance claims recovery income statement account. So we call it a contra expense because it's gonna offset your claims expense account. All right, the next type of reinsurance agreement is non-proportional. So as the name suggests, it's not necessarily the same on every policy, like the quota share we just talked about. So this is more a per occurrence excess or a catastrophic treaty. So as we, the definition here notes, the reinsurer is only going to be involved if combined claims from a single event um, exceed an agreed upon threshold. So the examples we give here are like a hurricane or an earthquake where you're expecting that there could be a lot of claims from one event. So like you noted, that is a key thing to note is that typically these are based on accumulation from one event. So why might someone go with this option instead of the quota share is that there it's pretty specific. So you're trying to identify a one-time event or something specific in general, you're trying to ensure maybe there's a specific risk and you can set up more unique terms for each agreement. So if the risk is different enough that it seems like that quota share, you don't want to split the risk the same for every type of coverage or policy, this per occurrence or the catastrophic coverage can let you do that with your reinsurance agreement. The next type is an excess of loss. So this is similar to the catastrophic, but it's not so much tied to one specific event. Um, it's more on a per risk or per policy basis. So that first bullet point where we talk about the reinsurance, it pays out once a certain deductible is met. So typically uh, the company, the insurance company has to retain a certain amount. They have to pay a certain number, dollar amount of claims, and then the reinsurance kicks in. So an example we give here is maybe there's one accident that has multiple deaths and there's litigation and all of those things, because that's all still tied to one policy, um, it would all go towards that retention limit. So again, similar to the catastrophic, is it's similar coverage here, is you're addressing the risk of when claims get super high that you can, maybe you can't always predict. The main difference here is that the catastrophic is tied to a specific event, like we said, hurricane or an earthquake. This is more if any policy reaches a certain level, then the reinsurance kicks in. So we'll go through a couple more types. So aggregate stop loss, this kind of builds on the excess of loss. So we noted the excess of loss was if a specific policy pays a certain amount of claims, then the reinsurance kicks in. This aggregate stop loss is more of a comprehensive approach. So it ensures that claims overall will not exceed a predetermined level. So you'll see that second bullet point. This kind of helps at least for me connect the dots a little bit. So it might be that, for example, if they have an excess of loss policy, maybe no individual policy goes super high, but everything is just paying a little bit more. So although if they only had the excess of loss policy, no reinsurance would kick in because not enough had been paid. But if they have this aggregate stop loss, if we take all of those policies and combine them and claims have hit a certain level, this is when this type of reinsurance kicks in. And so as we note here, it's usually that level is based on a percentage of premium or it might be a fixed dollar amount that when in aggregate, when all the claims have reached in total a certain level, then they'll get start getting reimbursed by their reinsurer. One last thing just to mention, this is more of a one-time event versus a agreement, I guess I would say, an ongoing reinsurance agreement. This is a lost portfolio transfer. So let's say that an insurance company has written a set of policies and maybe they decide we don't want to insure and um, we don't want to insure auto insurance in a specific state anymore. 
if that's the case, then they could do what's called a lost portfolio transfer, where they're going to take that whole block of business and the associated policies and transfer it to someone else. Uh, depending on the agreement, they may still process those claims and then just get reimbursed by the other insurer, or it could be that they transfer everything and they no longer do anything associated with those. That one's just something more to be aware of. Um, and those agreements are also pretty unique for each in instance they happen. So we're gonna go through some journal entries. Since those last kind of cluster we went through were all excess of loss with where the company has to retain a certain amount and then they can um, get reimbursed. We're just gonna go through one set of journal entries but know that the concept is the same for most of those. So for excess of loss contracts, Typically, there is a monthly premium that the insurance company pays to have that insurance, just the same as you and I pay our monthly car insurance premium. The insurance company has to pay their premium to have that reinsurance coverage. So when you pay that, and there's a variety of ways that can be determined, um, but regardless, when you pay that, you're going to debit an expense account, typically labeled something like reinsurance premium expense and then credit the asset as you pay that out. So for that second set of journal entries, this is where we're gonna book based on actual claims. So a couple of assumptions for this example. We're assuming that based on their reinsurance agreement, a million dollars is the retention level. So the insurance company has to pay out a million dollars in claims before the reinsurance will kick in. We're also assuming at this point in time that they've already paid out $800,000 in claims. So as we come up on this, we'll see the claim that they're paying out is $400,000. So they're going to book the claims expense for that full amount and pay out the cash. But then if we think through it, they've already paid 800, adding the 400,000 puts them at the 1.2 million in claims. Their retention is only 1 million, which means they're gonna be expecting $200,000 to come back from the reinsurer. So you'll see here that we've booked a reinsurance recoverable, we've debited that for the $200,000, and then a reinsurance claims recovery account also for the $200,000.